It's 8 p.m. in Japan. Welcome to News in Tokyo. I'm Hideki Nakayama. And I'm Aki Shibuya. Here are the headlines. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe hopes to move ahead on the peace treaty and territorial issues in its Moscow summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Tokyo court has rejected a second bail request for former Nissan Motor Chairman Carlos Ghosn. The International Monetary Fund has cut its forecast for global economic growth, citing trade tensions and Brexit. Authorities have confirmed the birth of twins whose genes were edited by a controversial Chinese researcher. And on The Focus, we go to global business hub Singapore, where we look at the hidden costs of its successful growth. We start in Moscow, where Japan's prime minister is hoping for some diplomatic progress as he meets Russia's president. He aims to move closer to solving the issue of Russian-held islands claimed by Japan, as well as concluding a peace treaty, which was never signed after World War II. Shinzo Abe is scheduled to meet Vladimir Putin at this hour. It's not confirmed if the meeting had started yet. In November, the two leaders agreed to accelerate treaty negotiations based on a 1956 joint declaration. It states that after a treaty is concluded, two of the four Russian-held islands will be handed over to Japan. В Москву сегодня прибыл премьер-министр Японии Синдзе Абба. Его самолет совершил посадку около двух часов назад. При этом лайнер был украшен флагами двух стран. Страпа глава японского правительства сошел, держа за руку свою супругу. Абба reportedly wants to finalize the broad terms of an agreement when Putin comes to Japan for the G20 summit in June. But officials in Moscow have downplayed hopes of a quick resolution. They urged Japan to recognize Russian sovereignty over the islands as a result of World War II. Abe is trying to find common ground and economic incentives for Russia. Japanese people who once lived on the Russian-held islands are watching the developments with a mixture of hope and skepticism. I'm hoping that at least two of the four islands will be returned. We'll keep on pressing for that. As time goes by, the Russian government is strengthening its effective control over the islands. We former residents see this as the last chance. A Tokyo court has shot down another bail request by Nissan Motors' former chairman. Carlos Ghosn has now been in custody for over two months. That period is likely to stretch even longer, with little prospect he'll be released anytime soon. This is the second time his defense team had applied for bail, following his most recent indictment earlier this month. Ghosn had released a statement promising to stay in Japan, wear a monitoring device, and respect any other bail conditions set by the court. He also reportedly offered to surrender his passports, but that wasn't enough to convince the court to let him go. Gon's case has attracted worldwide media attention along with criticism of his extended detention. Well, let's take a quick look at some other stories making world headlines. The former Nissan chairman Carlos Ghosn is to remain behind bars in Japan after a Tokyo court rejected his request for bail. The court said it still considers the 64-year-old a flight risk. The former Nissan chairman is accused of a number of financial misconduct charges. Sources say the court rejected the bail request because Ghosn may still conspire with others to conceal evidence. In Japan, a person who has been indicted can be held for up to two months. Prosecutors can then apply for an extension. Defendants under investigation by special prosecutors tend to be detained for long periods when they deny the charges as Gon has done. His lawyers are expected to appeal the decision. In a high-profile court appearance two weeks ago, Gon insisted he was innocent on all charges. And as a business with Yuko Fukushima. So Yuko, what's in the headlines today? 
Well, one is on Japan restarting imports, uh, oil imports from Iran. Now, Hideki, you were correspondent in Iran. How should we view this exception to the embargo to, to the U.S. sanctions? Okay, well, temporary, that's the key point. Um, the U.S. wants the, the countries that are exempted to ulti ultimately cut the imports to zero. So for Washington, it's just like a step along the way to enforce you know, the sanctions fully. I see, just the process. Okay, thank you. I will get back to the detail on that story in just a moment. But first, expectations are that the global economy will be more sluggish this year. That's according to the International Monetary Fund. It's lowering its forecast for growth amid weak performance in Europe and rising trade tensions. The bottom line is that after two years of solid expansion, the world economy is growing more slowly than expected and risks are rising. But even as the economy continues to move ahead, as I said, it is facing significantly higher risks. The IMF released its latest Global Outlook report on Monday ahead of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. It now expects the world's economy to expand by 3.5% in 2019. That's down two-tenths of a percentage point from the forecasts made in October last year. The downward revision for Germany was even greater, a cut of six-tenths of a percentage point. The report cites the effect of Europe's stricter fuel emission standards on the auto industry. Predictions for Italy and France were also downgraded. Following the overwhelming rejection of her Brexit deal last week, British Prime Minister Theresa May is now scrambling to gather support for a new agreement to leave the EU. An IMF official says the worst-case scenario on Brexit would have serious repercussions. A no-deal Brexit is one of the major risks to our forecast. If there is a disruptive uh, exit or if there is continued uncertainty for many more months, both of those are going to weigh negatively on growth going forward. Growth forecasts remain the same for the United States at 2.5% and China at 6.2 percent. But the IMF notes trade tensions between the countries continue to cause concern. China's growth slowdown could be faster than expected, especially if trade tensions continue. And this can trigger abrupt sell-offs in financial and commodity markets, as was the case in 2015-2016. The forecast for Japan went up based on expectations of a boost from government efforts to offset a consumption tax hike scheduled for October. On Tuesday, business and political leaders from around kick off the World Economic Forum in Davos. More than 3,000 are expected to attend this year's meeting, which takes place against a backdrop of deepening gloom over the global economic and political outlook. The recent slowing of the Chinese economy seems to be spilling over into South Korea. China is the country's biggest trading partner. Officials at the Bank of Korea say preliminary figures show the GDP expanded about 2.7% in 2018. That would be four tenths of a point less than the previous year and the slowest growth since 2012. The construction sector was among the hardest hit. It saw a decline of about 4% due to a cooling of the real estate market. Corporate investment also fell by 1.7 percent. South Korean media is reporting consumers are getting concerned about the situation in China. They say uncertainties are growing over both the economic slowdown in the country and its trade dispute with the United States. South Korean President Moon Jae-in once had an approval rate of more than 80 percent, but that has fallen to the 40 percent level, largely due to public frustration over his economic policies. Japan is reportedly preparing to receive its first shipment of oil from Iran since an embargo was announced. Iran's central bank governor said on Monday Japan has begun procedures to resume imports following similar moves by China and South Korea. The Trump administration decided to reimpose economic sanctions against Iran in November. But Washington granted Japan and seven other countries an exemption. They can keep buying Iranian oil for 180 days until May. Major Japanese oil wholesaler Showa Shell Seku is already preparing to transport the crude. 
Japan's largest oil wholesaler, JXTG Holdings, is soon expected to follow suit. The Japanese government plans to negotiate with the U.S. to get a further exemption from the embargo. And now to the markets. In Tokyo, the Nikkei fell about half a percent in thin trading. Many U.S. investors were taking a day off for a national holiday. The latest outlook by the IMF dampened sentiment. Oil-related shares were major decliners on the back of lower oil prices. Over in China, the Shanghai Composite declined 1.2 percent. Worries over the tech sector increased on reports the U.S. will formally ask Canada to extradite an executive of Chinese telecom equipment maker Huawei. And to the rest of the region in Seoul, the Cosby ended a third of a percent lower following that weak GDP data out of South Korea. And Sydney's index snapped a five-day winning streak, losing more than half a percent. It was dragged down by the world's biggest miner, BHP Group. Uh, the firm slumped after reporting a decline in quarterly iron ore production. Now, times are tough for Japan's farmers. They're facing serious labor shortages and intense competition from abroad. But now, artificial intelligence is offering the hope of better produce, higher yields, and less toiling in the fields. As Gerald Hiroki Okatani reports. The workers at this farm once relied heavily on chemical pesticides. But times have changed. A small drone now buzzes overhead. It's equipped with a 4K camera. And it's programmed to track the rows of Chinese cabbage and broccoli. The camera has a bird's eye view, and a very sharp one at that. It can spot a millimeter wide hole in a cabbage leaf from a height of five meters. An AI program then analyzes past data to judge whether an insect is to blame. The crops are then dusted selectively, only in areas where pests have been spotted. It means less work for the farmer and fewer pesticides on the crops. The farmer's owner says he's cut their use of chemicals by more than two-thirds. We're just always so busy that the drone takes care of things we can't handle, so it gives us a kind of peace of mind. Another farmer is experimenting with technology to produce high-quality tea leaves, regardless of the weather. A sensor buried in the soil constantly measures water content. Equipment on the roof keeps track of temperature and humidity. It factors in evaporation rates and calculates exactly how much water and nutrients to give. Both are delivered to the tea plants automatically. The aim is to produce premium tea without being bound by fickle nature. High precision farming will help us produce good tea leaves through the meticulous crop management. It's an extremely important approach. The technology comes from a company in Israel, where land is scarce and land is limited. The company fed an AI program with 50 years of farming data. The program is also linked to a sensor that provides real-time data. The company says people in the future will be able to farm higher quality products with less experience. And make the Japanese farmers much more precise, more accurate, enable them to grow much more with less water, less fertilizer, and be much more uh, sustainable and effective and efficient. The cost of the setup means most people won't be switching quite yet. But this could be a glimpse of a future where computers do as much of the plowing as farmers. Hiroki Okatani, NHK World. That's the biz for this Tuesday. Tuesday marks one month since a deadly tsunami hit the Indonesian islands of Java and Sumatra. Chalapasa Narel in Bangkok has more. 
The death toll stands at 437. More than 4,000 people remain displaced. The locals live in fear of another giant wave. A volcanic eruption in the Sunda Strait triggered the tsunami. With no sign of imminent disaster, people had no time to brace. Damage was widespread. Disaster authorities warned that the volcano is still volatile. It was the second tsunami to devastate the country last year. The first struck the island of Sulawesi in September following a huge earthquake. NHK's Jakarta Bureau Chief Shinosuke Kawashima visited some of the hard-hit areas in western Java. Shinosuke, tell us about the situation on the ground. A major issue is that many people are still in evacuation centers. Even now, they don't know when they'll be able to rebuild their lives. We visited a kindergarten, currently home to more than 260 people. Many had their homes washed away. Authorities say it will take about two more months to build temporary housing units. What's more, a large number of evacuees are fishermen. Their boats swept away. Their livelihoods now in tatters. Worsening sanitation is also causing serious health concerns, with people crammed into small buildings. Volunteer nurses do their best to keep on top of the situation. Now my daughter is sick. She has a cough and a fever. She was just treated by a doctor yesterday. The welfare of the evacuees is certainly a concern. And how has the disaster affected the local economy? Western Java is famous for its beachside hotels and the restaurants. A number of tourists also lost their lives in the tsunami. Many businesses don't know when they'll be able to reopen. Even facilities that escaped serious damage are now also hurting. A hotel we visited has been hit by one cancellation after another. It was, un it, it was unable to turn a profit during the peak season from December to early January. This month, reservations number just two. The reality has forced the operator to slash the number of staff from 10 to 2. I think maybe it will take a year to get this area back to normal. We really need support and contributions from the government. With the volcano seemingly about to blow again at any moment, I sense the latest disaster is still far from over. Indonesia has been hit hard in recent months, making it more vital than ever to continue supporting the recovery. Thank you, Shinosuke. Now turning to China, where the government is threatening to punish a scientist who claimed to produce gene-edited twins. A state-run news agency says investigators confirmed this claim for the first time and slammed the man. An associate professor of the Southern University of Science and Technology sought personal fame when he received money, intentionally evaded supervision, and privately organized people to conduct reproductive gene editing in embryos. That's clearly banned by state regulations. Xinhua News Agency quoted Chinese authorities as saying he recruited 16 people, some with HIV. He said he'd manipulated the genes in a set of twins born to one couple to make them HIV resistant. The report says that seriously violated ethical principles and scientific integrity. It says authorities will punish him as well as people who helped him in line with Chinese law. The university the scientists work for says it has terminated his contract. A flurry of sexual abuse claims in elite South Korean sports has spread to speed skating. A group representing six female athletes says they were abused by their coaches. They follow two-time Olympic female short track champion Shim Sokhi, who accuses a former coach of repeatedly raping her. For their prolonged silence, a lawmaker on Monday also pointed the finger elsewhere at former skating national team coach Chong Mingyu. Professor Chong Myung-yu has heard from the victims about sexual assault and was fully aware of the situation, but he did not take action. The perpetrator is still working in the field of ice skating. This makes us believe Professor Chung has been involved in whitewashing these issues. 
Chong remains a powerful figure in South Korean skating. At a news conference the same day, he rejected allegations linking him to the scandal between games medalist Shim and her coach, currently serving a 10-month prison term for assaulting athletes. There's no way for me to know about every aspect of sexual violence that takes place. I didn't know that Cho Jie Bom habitually assaulted Shim Sok Hee. The Me Too movement against sexual harassment of women has recently gained traction in South Korean sports. Athletes in judo, taekwondo and wrestling have also spoken out. That wraps up our bulletin. I'm Chola Pansan Arula in Bangkok. Singapore is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, but there's a side to it that we don't often get to see. Let's bring in Aiko Dod and our special affairs commentator for more. Now, when people think of Singapore, the words like clean, safe, efficient and, of course, prosperous come to mind. But the island state's stunning economic growth has come at a cost. During the day, poverty is nowhere to be seen in Singapore. The island state's GDP per capita now stands at just over $60,000, making it the ninth richest in the world. But at night, homeless people spill out of the shadows and onto the streets in search of sustenance. It's sad to grow old like this. We don't need much, as long as we can eat. It's not important whether the economy grows or not. The most important thing is food. In 2017, the Ramon Magsaysay Award, known as Asia's Nobel Prize, was given to Singaporean social activist Tony Tay. I never thought that our work will grow so big. There is no big plans when we started. He was recognized for helping Singapore's disadvantaged. Tony has been providing free meals to those in need since 2003. Through the aid organization he founded called Willing Hearts, nearly 200 volunteers prepare and deliver about 6,000 hot meals a day. They need bread. My childhood, when there's no bread, we kneel down and pray for bread. After that, we start a small group. From a small pot to bigger, 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 until a giant pot. Poverty exists not just on the streets. 80% of the population live in flats built by the Housing and Development Board, or the HDB. In this ageing society of 5.6 million, elderly residents often reside in these apartments, isolated and destitute. You showed me around uh, yeah. Singapore okay. and said that uh, in Singapore it's hard to see poverty because it's invisible. Correct. Well, what did you mean by that? But you see, because we have HDB flats mm -hmm. and all of us are staying in a flat, so the door is always shut. You can't see anything. Mm. Willing Heart focuses on reaching out to the aging poor. This 72-year-old woman suffered from polio in childhood. Since her parents and siblings have passed away, she has no choice but to depend on help from the government and social workers. So Tony's volunteers visit her every day to check on her welfare. I'm very suffering for myself. No, you still got the strength. You are down here. You know what I mean? I tell you, want to visit you, I visit you, see? Sweetheart, right? Yeah, I understand. What happened in the flat, nobody knows. I'm hungry, or I'm rich, or I'm poor. So now is how are we going to know a neighbor? To understand a neighbor, to say good morning to a neighbor. Then we will know what happened. Willing Hearts also supports migrant workers who live on meagre salaries. In Singapore, about 40% of the population comes from abroad. 
These are some of Willing Heart's hot meal menu choices. Fish. Yeah, we don't cook meat here. Oh. No pork. Why is that? Because we uh, have Muslim, we got Indian, we got Chinese. As you see, we have all the different group of people come in, mm -hmm. different nationality, mm -hmm. come together, learn, bring home and start there. We are a group of people who call ourselves Singaporeans. And the foreigners come in as one of us, as one united family. As disparity in society has become impossible to ignore, people are asking themselves, isn't there something we can do to help as Singaporeans? Have you come here before? Uh, no, this is my first time. And what do you usually do for work? Um, I'm a financial consultant. I'm willing to, to give the time and effort uh, that can help to make the people lives better. Why not? Does, does Singapore look like a happy country? It should look happy. If they're not happy, it means something wrong with them. Where we went wrong? We must change ourselves. We must see where we went wrong. Tony is delivering a powerful message to the next generation of Singaporeans via his willing hearts. Now, why are we going and why are we helping the poor? You know the poor is helping you, right? They are helping us to improve our life, number one. Number two, they are helping us to build our poor spirit to a happier spirit. You know that we are helping them and they are helping us to understand what is life. Wow, Tony Tay is an inspirational man. You know, he just said in his interview that the underprivileged helps us understand what life is, and that just hit me. So, Aiko, um, what is the face of poverty actually like in Singapore? Well, um, I think it's really uh, hitting the elderly hard. And uh, since Singapore is one of the fastest growing uh, economies in the world, this will only get worse. Uh, one in four will be over 65 by 2030, according to one government estimate. So retiring in this wealthy country can often mean uh, living through life savings uh, because living costs are so high. And of course, there are uh, government measures in place. Uh, there is a scheme called CPF, uh, or Central Provident Fund, which is a compulsory savings uh, plan for working people to fund their retirement and other future uh, needs. And, and there is a, the Workfare Income Supplement, in which if you earn less than a certain amount, the government will provide funds towards basic living, future uh, forward basic uh, living expenses. But there are people who fall through that safety net, uh, and that is why there are more organisations like uh, Tony's Willing Hearts uh, who are addressing that need. Mm -hmm. So I call them cooking 6,000 meals every day, right? Yes. That's a tremendous undertaking. And um, they looked all good. Well, yes. 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 And, but how does Tony make this initiative sustainable? Well, he has adopted various approaches. Like uh, numerous global firms have their Asia um, bases in Singapore. And many of them want to align with the organizations like Tony's uh, Willing Hearts as an ideal uh, organization, offering donations and other supports. Uh, some food processing companies are giving, giving away products as well as sending out their employees for volunteers. There is even an app or a website uh, which will enable you to book a slot uh, when you want to volunteer, just as you would uh, book uh, restaurant reservations. Um, not everyone uh, can afford the time to volunteer the entire weekend, but might want to book, say, uh, two hours on a Saturday uh, morning. The point is, if you add uh, all this up, you may be able to accomplish something big and the initiative becomes more sustainable because you're not asking people to sacrifice so much in terms of money or time. Um, so it's literally the sum of such willing hearts that makes an initiative sustainable. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
Israel says it has hit Iranian targets in Syria with airstrikes. Some reports say the death toll is at least 10, including Syrian soldiers. The Israeli military released video of some of the more than 10 targets it bombed early on Monday. They included munition stores and training facilities for Iran's elite forces in Syria, as well as key points in Syria's anti-air defense system. Israel says the airstrikes were in retaliation for a missile attack launched from Syria by Iranian forces. That, in turn, was in response to the previous day's air raid by Israel. Syria's state-run news agency says Syrian forces successfully intercepted each wave of Israeli missiles and prevented any damage. But other media outlets in the country report at least 10 people were killed, including four Syrian soldiers. There are concerns military clashes could intensify if Syrian and Iranian forces launch counterattacks against Israel. Islamic State militant group says it was behind a deadly attack on a convoy of U.S. forces and their Kurdish allies in northern Syria. It's the second attack on U.S. forces in less than a week. The Britain-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says five people were killed when a vehicle exploded at a checkpoint on Monday. The observatory says the five victims were soldiers. The U.S. Defense Department says there were no American casualties. The Islamic State group issued a statement saying the attack was aimed at U.S. forces. The group also claimed responsibility for a suicide bombing in northern Syria last Wednesday that left 19 people dead. U.S. President Donald Trump announced last month he was pulling U.S. forces out of Syria, saying the militant group had been defeated. The decision has been criticized in the United States, even by Trump's allies. Some say the announcement may have given the militants confidence. An 86-year-old Japanese adventurer has abandoned his quest to climb South America's highest mountain. Yuichiro Miura began climbing Mount Aconcagua on Friday. He got within 1,000 meters of the top, but he was held up by harsh weather. He waited two days. Then a doctor said Miura was at risk of heart failure. Miura spoke to NHK via telephone. Suddenly a doctor told me I had to stop. It was so hard to accept. It took me about one hour to decide to go down the mountain. Miura also told us he is already making plans for another challenge. I am planning to try to climb Mount Everest when I reach 90 years old, so I will take care of myself so my body can adjust to such high altitude mountaineering. The boyfriend of Japan's Princess Mako says his family's financial problems have been settled. The couple's engagement was postponed after media reported on the story. Kei Komuro released his first public statement on the matter, saying he's sorry for causing confusion by not giving a clear explanation. Komuro says his mother's former fiancé wanted her to repay him money even though he'd previously declined her offer to do so. Last November, Prince Akishino said Komuro should respond appropriately to the matter if the couple wants to marry. Sources say the two still intend to marry. Komuro is currently doing a three-year stint in a New York law school, aiming to pass the state's bar exam. Christians in China are living in fear amid a government crackdown on the way they practice their faith. A mass arrest last month shows that authorities are becoming less tolerant of the minority religion. NHK World's Ryuta Oktani reports. Police in the southwestern city of Chandu conduct a raid after dark. They detain more than 100 people, including Christian leaders and followers, offering no public explanation. This priest couple was among those taken into custody. 
they are charged with inciting the subversion of state power, becoming the first priest to face the allegation. This man knows the Christians affected. He speaks on condition of anonymity. Church leaders are being followed wherever they go. They're all very scared. There has been a strong backlash against Christianity ever since President Xi Jinping's announcement at the last party congress. We must stand by our policy to make sure the nation's religions have Chinese characteristics and carry on with socialism. While China's constitution grants freedom of religion, authorities are exercising more control over citizens who adhere to particular beliefs. The official number of Christians is 44 million, but that figure is believed to be double once so-called underground churches are taken into account. One expert says Communist Party leaders fear that Christianity could shake the political base. The Communist Party looks at Christianity as a religion that promotes universal values, such as freedom, democracy and human rights. Such values could threaten the one-party rule. The government is escalating its control over the religion. It had shut down underground churches before, but now it's also hauling crosses off rooftops and putting up Communist Party slogans, even at authorized places of worship. And there are surveillance cameras inside. Children are not allowed to join the prayers. Devoted Christian Yem Mai Xiu has been attending church for many years. She said she was once arrested for joining an unauthorized prayer and as a result spent four years in prison. But Yen won't sacrifice her faith. Jesus suffered throughout his life. I'm following his path. The road ahead looks rocky for Christians in China. The crackdowns show they are being closely monitored by a government that's exerting control on every corner of society. Ryuta Okutani, NHK World, Beijing. Hello, I'm meteorologist Jonathan O with a look at the weather and we're going to begin in East Asia where here in Tokyo it's been dry, too dry. We haven't seen rain or type of precipitation in more than a week and it's going to be dry again. Yeah, I mean, I'm emphasizing the fact that we're not seeing much in precipitation from Tokyo points westward. Uh, we will see snow returning, though, for the northern areas of Japan as we go forward in time. So let me show you what's happening on the map here. And there's going to be a couple of features here that you want to look out for. Low pressure up here will be one story maker, weather maker over into the northern portions of Japan. High pressure back toward the west, keeping things relatively dry, but it will interact with this thing down here. Ah, uh, yeah, we're talking about a tropical system. Might be a tropical storm as we go into Wednesday. So we'll watch those closely as we go forward in time. All these factors will be playing with each other. So let's start first in Japan. Uh, low pressure system, cutoff system moving through. And as it sweeps on through, guess what happens? We will see cold air coming back into the picture, which means snow is going to be a part of the story from Hokkaido through Hokuriku. So if you are a fan of snow, You'll see some more as you go up toward the north. Uh, some places could see close to 50 centimeters, though, so be able to look out for that uh, because there's going to be a lot of accumulation into the Tohoku region. Still seeing some snow also into the Hokkaido region as well. But again, Tokyo, dry again yeah for the rest of the week in fact and so if you're dealing with some of the impacts from that unfortunately it's going to stay like that as we go forward in time uh down to the philippines yeah we have this kind of huddled cloud mass that's going to try to keep itself together and eventually drifting toward the north and northeast if so it's going to interact with a high and that may actually create some more rain up further toward the north as well but for those of you in the philippines more rain coming up as we go through wednesday manila looking at some showers 12 degrees for the high in tokyo dry again so we're at six eight in beijing and look at this, plenty of dry weather as high pressure controls the uh, forecast as we go through Wednesday from Shanghai down to Hong Kong as we go through the day.
That's a look at your forecast. Hope you have a good day wherever you are. Well, thanks, Jonathan. And if you've missed any of our stories, please visit our NRG website. And that's it for today's News from Tokyo. I'm Hideki Nakayama. And I'm Aki Shibuya. Coming up next, an HK World interview program, Direct Talk. Stay with us.